1646, the Dutch lawyer and businessman Adrian van der Donk chose a location on the Nepperhan River, a short distance from where it flows into the mighty Hudson, as the site for a new sawmill. Previously, the native Lenape had chosen the same spot for their village, which they called Nepekamak. Van der Donk played a considerable role in bringing understanding of the entire region to European interests. He was locally referred to as the Yonk Heer, or Young Squire, a word from which the city of Yonkers derives its name. Following his untimely death in 1655, his estate was sold off, and in 1672 a large parcel was bought by Frederick Phillips, who added it to his considerable holdings in the area. In 1682, Phillips and his wife Margaret, whose wealth and business acumen rivaled that of her husband, built the first section of what would become their family's home generations later. Subsequent additions to the house by their grandson and great-grandson resulted in the structure we see today. After nearly a century of wealth and prominence, the family's fortunes turned in 1776 when Frederick Phillips III, an ardent and vocal British loyalist, was arrested on orders issued by General George Washington. The house and the entire Phillips estate were confiscated and sold in 1779. Other families occupied the house until 1868, when it became Yonkers Village Hall. When the city incorporated, it became the first city hall in Yonkers and remained so until 1908. At that time, a generous gift of $50,000 from Ava Smith Cochran enabled the manor hall to pass into state ownership and, after a complete restoration, open as a museum. In 1911, fearing the possibility of a fire, Stewards of the Manor Hall decided to remove the heating system from inside the house. With additional support from the Cochrane family, a remote heating plant was built into a newly constructed brick cottage at the northwest corner of the property. This building was also designed to be used as a residence for a full-time caretaker. Built to provide both logistical and material support to the museum, the cottage has to date provided over 100 years of service. In that time, the cottage has received several renovations and upgrades. A fire in 1933, which seriously injured a state trooper, heavily damaged the cottage, destroying the roof. The last major modification was completed in the mid-1970s. Currently, a restoration of the cottage exterior funded by a generous gift from RxR developers, is underway. The project is supervised by Rich Gromek, New York State's Historic Restoration Coordinator for the Taconic Region. And so the cottage was uh, built as a caretaker's cottage. And during the American Scenic period, which lasted until the state acquired it in 1966, the cottage was a residence. And then after the state took over the site uh, again in 1966, um, it was soon after converted to offices. So one of the things that went in in probably the early 1970s was uh, men's and women's bathrooms were uh, um, installed in a couple of the first floor rooms. And since that time, with the passage of the American Disabilities Act, we can't make those restrooms um, accessible. So the uh, little addition bathroom on the manor hall is now the accessible restroom for the site. And we converted one of the restrooms in the, in the uh, cottage back to an office. Well, uh, we interpret the manor hall as a continuum, not just to a specific time period, not say to just 1750, but it also as a city hall and as a public historic site we tend to interpret the entire span of its existence. Um, along those lines, the cottage was built during that late period when it became a public historic site. So it was built uh, to be compatible with the manor hall in the Dutch colonial revival style. And it is over 100 years old. It is going on 110 years old now. So it is significant in its own right. Um, but it is also a contributing historic structure to the National Historic Landmark status of the Manor Hall. 
Well, we try to repair instead of replace anything, anything that's historic material. So any woodwork repair, um, you know, we use epoxy uh, consolidant and patching. And, um, you know, in this case, the roof, we're not going to a historic material. We don't know what the original roof was. Oh, interesting. We know probably in 1929, a slate roof was put on at the same time that the manor hall got a new slate roof. Um, Later, uh, probably in the 1970s, that slate roof was replaced with asphalt shingles. So what we're doing now is it's not important to match any look exactly or any material exactly on the roof. So that's an asphalt shingle that's got a slate look to it. Right. Um, and so what's the scope of the work being done now? What are we, what are we we're seeing? We're replacing the roof. Okay. We're doing replacing the uh, copper built-in gutters and, and roof flashing. Um, some minor exterior masonry repointing of the brickwork, uh, woodwork repairs, uh, and exterior painting. So can you tell me a little bit about the gutters? They seem to be a special part of this project. What is, what's unique about these built-in gutters? Uh, well, the uh, copper uh, built-in gutters are um, architecturally so that you don't see attached gutters on the building. Uh, and it's, a, it's an architectural choice to do that. Uh, but the material should last 75 or 80 years. So we should get not only this roof, but they should last through the next roof that goes on this building. The roof should last 40 years. Uh, the painting work in, in this environment in Yonkers, uh, we would get probably 10 years out of it and, and hope for 12. Uh, and the masonry repointing should last 50 to 80 years uh, pretty easily. Well, the technology in, in 1911 wasn't all that different from today, so most, mostly we're using modern materials. Of course, we wouldn't use lead paint the way they would in 1911. Right. Um, the, um, in 1911, they would have had Portland cement uh, mm -hmm. used in the mortar. Uh, we could do that again, but we've chosen both for environmental and historic preservation reasons to use a natural hydraulic lime, which is uh, akin to uh, a historic lime mortar. While we were doing the roof, we found uh, some charred roof sheathing and, and charred rafters. Uh, and apparently there was a fire uh, in 1933, we came to find out later on. So uh, some of the roof sheathing did have to get replaced this time, but the rafters are structurally sound. The cottage location seems to underscore its supporting role. Tucked away in the northwest corner of the property, its modest design, described as Dutch colonial revival, was intended to blend into the grand presence of the manor hall rather than make a statement of its own. And while the cottage may never be mistaken as the main event, its ultimate significance might actually have to do with the people who lived and worked there. In the over 100 years since it was built, the caretaker's cottage has been home to four caretakers and their families. Although originally intended to provide a permanent presence for on-site personnel, the cottage today houses offices and administrative space. No one lives here anymore, except perhaps a few squirrels. Nancy Bauer and her family lived in the cottage during the mid-1960s. Her father, Albert Ludwig Bauer, was the site's final caretaker. Nancy's recollections provide a valuable glimpse into what it was like to live at Phillips Manor Hall. What years did you live here? Um, it feels like 1963 to like 68, 69. Okay. You know, but it felt like we spent a lifetime here, you know. Yeah, and your whole family, your brother and sister, you, yeah. the three of you lived here. Yeah. Um, would you mind walking through the house with us and giving us an idea of what the layout would have been? Sure, I don't, mind. I don't okay. mind at all. So what was this room when sure. you lived here? This room would have been the living room, okay? And when we moved here, it was the greatest thing for us because we were told that, you know what, we got a new couch. We're going to get a new TV. Mm. So we all get excited and everything, you know, and then the day that Daddy brings the TV home and it used to sit right there, it was like this big on like a 
little rolling cart thing and everything. It was still black and white. <laughs> I swear to that God. That hadn't changed. <laughs> I think I was 19 before I found out that the Wizard of Oz was in color. <laughs> You know, <laughs> so and then if you walk through here, this would have been our kitchen area mm -hmm. in here, and um, I have to remember this right. So okay. are these the same built-in cabinets then that are in the one photo? Yes, yeah, and it's in that one picture of my mom. You could see her mixer in the back right. and dishes on the shelves and everything. Our table was set up in here. Um, I really can't remember if the stove was here or over here and no. the refrigerator. Like It was one or the other, but I'm pretty sure the stove was over here. Of course, th this was the hallway, but this room here didn't serve as a kitchen at the time. It was We called it our utility room. Mm -hmm. There was a commode in there, a small sink, you know, shelving and everything. That's where we kept the first aid kit for the grounds, uh -huh. you know. And um, we kept our washer and dryer in there. That was our utility room. Gotcha. Then this room here that's now our bathroom this for the building, this was my mom and dad's bedroom Okay. at the time. And on the wall, on that far wall, there was a door that went through hmm. into the next room, uh -huh. and that was our den. But people, people that come to visit the house, a lot of people always ask whether or not there are ghosts here because it's an old house. People always want to know. Well, we had a tabby cat and we had a dog. And if I open the cellar door here, You could still see the scratch marks on the door from where Thumper was trying to get out because some people feel that there were ghosts downstairs. He didn't, he didn't like to be down there. Oh, no, and neither like the cat either. You would have to literally throw them down the stairs. <laughs> sure. Well, yeah. basically, as far as that, w the house, the way it was when we moved in, was to remain that way. Uh-huh. And there were certain things that we had to be careful of, like the wallpaper and that, not to mess it up. Um, we did have the open windows here, which is part of the restora yeah, restoration they that they, they open them that. up, yeah. because I always said that. It was always so dark in here when it was boarded up. Mm -hmm. But she had like those sheer curtains here that you know have the mm -hmm. bar that goes across right. and the Keep bar across yep. the bottom, yeah. It was really nice. Betty and I shared this room, and this was hysterical too, because my mom had put our beds underneath each one of these little windows here, the fan windows, uh -huh. and any time Betty got mad at me, I wasn't allowed to go on her uh -huh. side of the room. So I couldn't come in or out, because that was her bed over there. And when I came to work here in 2004, this is where they put me back in my bedroom. <laughs> so, a lot of memories here. And when I first came back, I worked with a lot of great people. When we lived here, this was my brother's room. And it's a nice size for one kid, and he had a bed and a bureau, whatever. But the one thing that we didn't have over there, he had here, and that was the closet. So... When I had the chance to switch offices, that was my thing. I was going to be in this office because I was going to have <laughs> you that were closet. Get your closet. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what your dad's responsibilities were? There was still a lot of furniture here, uh -huh. like from the original, well, from the Cochrane collection, in that. Um, there were a lot of ceramics. There were a lot of paintings other than just the portraits. But he basically did everything himself that now a full staff would do here. Um, 
due to the economic circumstances. There aren't enough employees here on site, you know, to do a thorough job, but my dad did it all. He would stand out at the gate. Uh huh. Any, any of the three of them, he would stand out at the gate because there wasn't a parking lot there then and try to get people to come in, get them interested. Kids from the neighborhood used to come here all the time. Hmm. And daddy would let them go because his thing was like lighting that spark, you know. I used to follow him around the house all the time. We didn't have like set chores or mm -hmm. anything like for the property or in the house, but I would follow him. And even when I first started working here, that's the first thing I said, Daddy Spiel. Phillips Manor Hall, built in 1682, um, completed in 1748, was the first village, then city hall for the city of Yonkers, and so on. different from when you were living here what do you what do you remember about? it's a lot less cluttered when it's open like this with just the storyboards up when we lived here there were a lot of things like I said earlier furniture mm -hmm. tables chairs spinning wheels and in that picture you can see clearly it was a newspaper article but the Lincoln letter that we have used to hang over in that corner mm -hmm. That's now you know, upstairs. That's in now upstairs and right. protected. This um, was basically this was basically my dad's space. Uh -huh. um, but he had a big old roll top desk that was over there, and back then, you know, people smoked all over the place. There's an ashtray there and mm -hmm. everything. But this was basically his space in here. We welcome guests not through this door but through the southeast yeah, door. door. Right. Which would have led to the staircase then. Yeah. Sort of oh, yeah. This right. was one of my favorite places in the house. Um, I used to be able to sit on the banister and slide down. And if you lean in, right, in just the right spots, you could actually make it all the way around. <laughs> I wouldn't try that now. <laughs> I wouldn't suggest that anybody tries it now. But did your dad know you were doing it? I don't think so. <laughs> so I would point out different things and ask questions and answer questions, and then I would state, I am the youngest artifact in <laughs> Phillips Manor Hall, and you'd get the giggle or whatever smiles, and no, really, because my family was the last family to live on site. And we are part of the living history of Phillips Manor Hall. One of the things my mom stated and always stuck with me is that, you know, when we move here to Phillips Manor Hall, that we, as a family, we become stewards of the house. And to me, that meant we took care of it, we nurtured it, you know, we respected it. And to this day, that has stuck. It's interesting to wonder whether those who were responsible for building the cottage ever envisioned a day when their small brick building, as it was once described, would itself become a matter of historical significance. As an integral part of Phillips Manor Hall, it too now plays a role in the site's unfolding history. The story of those who lived and worked at Phillips Manor Hall spans over 300 years and includes famous landowners, anonymous slaves and servants, political leaders, and ordinary families who, at one time, thought of it as their home. Perhaps the caretaker's cottage reminds us that history happens on its own terms and is made every day in mostly ordinary ways. <laughs>